Hello, everyone, and welcome to Metcalf Institute's 23rd Annual Public Lecture Series. My name is Sunshine Menezes, and I'm Metcalf Institute's Executive Director. Uh, the University of Rhode Island's Metcalf Institute has been fostering informed public conversations about science and the environment since 1998. We take a variety of approaches to this work. We offer science training for professional journalists, such as our annual science immersion workshop for journalists, which has been happening last week and this week. We offer communication training for scientists all over the country. We organize the Inclusive SciComm Symposium, which brings together people from across the country to share practices and research that makes science communication more inclusive and equitable. And we offer public events like this one. This year, of course, is very different for Metcalf Institute as it is for everyone. Because of the coronavirus pandemic, this is the first time that we've conducted our annual science immersion workshop for journalists and our annual public lecture series virtually rather than in person. Originally, we planned for this year's lecture series to explore the practical implications of climate change. Specifically, we wanted to feature speakers who could discuss the ways we are already witnessing climate change and what we could expect to see with a global average temperature increase of two degrees Celsius, which is the global limit that the Paris Climate Agreement of 2015 was designed to achieve. While that topic by itself is a significant one, we all know that the novel coronavirus came into the equation earlier this year. As it became clear that COVID-19 would have significant effects on every aspect of our lives for the foreseeable future, we decided to expand this lecture series to look at how the pandemic might affect our responses to climate change. Over the last few weeks, the killings of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Tony McDade, Rhea Milton, Dominique Fells, and Rayshard Brooks, among countless other Black Americans before them, forced a national reckoning with anti-Black violence and the many ways that racism is structurally embedded in our society. This conversation is painful, difficult, and essential. So we decided to pivot our annual lecture series once again to address the intersections of these three critical issues, climate change, COVID-19, and systemic racism. Although it may not be immediately obvious to some of you, these three issues are very closely tied together. Climate change is often discussed as the great equalizer, but that's not accurate. It is more accurately described as the great magnifier because it magnifies existing inequalities. We've seen the same problems with COVID-19, which has disproportionately affected people of color in the United States. We acknowledge that we can only begin to scratch the surface of these intertwined issues in a one week webinar series. However, we hope that these discussions will provide all of you with new insights, food for thought, and most importantly, ideas for action. With that introduction, I'm thrilled to announce today's lecture and speaker. The single most effective way to address climate change is to significantly reduce our reliance on fossil fuels. Of course, this requires that we ramp up clean energy options to meet electrical and fuel needs. In the absence of federal leadership to regulate this shift, states and the private sector need to act aggressively to support a transition to low carbon options. This is something that we in Rhode Island have heard a lot about because we're the site of the first offshore wind farm in the country. And as we heard from Dr. Mijin Cha in yesterday's inaugural Leeson lecture, there are many co-benefits embedded in a just transition to a low carbon economy. But there is a reason that we haven't seen the kind of massive shift in our national energy portfolio that's needed to halt climate change. Today's speaker, Dr. Leah Stokes, will explain the organized combat between advocate and opponent interest groups in the energy sector and the structural changes that we need to address climate change and systemic racism. This is the topic of Dr. Stokes' new book, Short Circuiting Policy, which was published by Oxford University Press this spring. And I'll note that it's available as an ebook for only $11. Dr. Stokes is an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science, and she's also affiliated with the Bren School of Environmental Science and Management and the Environmental Studies Department at the University of California, Santa Barbara. She studies energy, climate, and environmental politics. Within American politics, her work focuses on representation and public opinion, as well as voting behavior, 
and public policy, particularly at the state level. Within environmental politics, Dr. Stokes researches climate change, renewable energy, water, and chemicals policy. Her research has been published in top political, policy, and environmental science journals. Her opinion pieces have been published in the New York Times, Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, The Guardian, and CNN, among others. She holds a PhD in public policy and a master's degree in political science, both from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She also has a master's of public administration in environmental science and policy from Columbia University and a bachelor's degree in psychology and East Asian studies from the University of Toronto. Prior to her academic position, Dr. Stokes worked at the Parliament of Canada and Resources for the Future. And now it's my pleasure to turn things over to Dr. Stokes. Well, thank you so much for having me and thanks to everybody for joining today. I see there's a lot of us on the call. Um, first, I just would like to acknowledge that um, we are all meeting today, regardless of where we are on Indigenous lands. And personally, I am sitting on Chumash and Shwumwich territory. And I know for many of us, um, systemic violence against Black and Indigenous people is on our minds. And so I just wanted to say a few things before I started my presentation. And I, I also added a few slides about some of my work on this topic. So climate justice is fundamentally about racial justice. 68% of Black Americans live within 30 miles of a coal plant. That statistic's a little out of date because thankfully coal plants have been closing. But actually, I have a new report coming out next week about the southeastern United States where large amounts of coal plants remain open, even though they are costing people money and, of course, costing people their lives, particularly Black Americans. So the pollution burden that falls very heavily on Black, Hispanic, and Indigenous people in this country makes it more likely that these groups are breathing dirty air and also makes it more likely for them to die from the COVID-19 pandemic because we know, of course, that this illness really affects people's lungs. And so if you've been breathing polluted air because your community has fossil fuel infrastructure in your backyard, that um, puts you at much higher risk for dying. And so we've seen the very high rates of death among Black Americans from COVID-19. Um, and that is in part linked directly to air pollution from the choices that we made as a society in terms of where we place fossil fuel plants. Of course, some indigenous communities are also facing very high rates of COVID and they're also facing polluted air and waters um, and traditional foods that they rely on have very high levels of toxins in them. And so our system overall, which I'm going to talk about, our fossil fuel based energy system is not providing equally to all Americans and black and indigenous communities are really on the front lines of the pollution crisis as well as the climate crisis. And of course, the systemic racism in our society is not just a question of environmental harms, but also a question of policing choices. So the violence that we are inflicting on these communities is not just a question of climate violence or um, pollution. It's also direct violence from the state in the form of policing and incarceration. And you might not know this, but um, the incarceration rates amongst Black and Indigenous people in this country are really high. In, in the indigenous community, seven times the rate of incarceration exists compared to white Americans. And in, for black Americans, it is six times higher. So if you've been following it, there's been some reporting today that 65,000 incarcerated people in this country have contracted COVID-19. And we don't even fully know the extent of it because of course they're not testing in all the prisons. I live nearby a prison and about half of all the um, infections in the county where I live have occurred in that penitentiary. So the choices that we're making in our society to incarcerate Black and Indigenous people is um, really problematic and is also increasing their likelihood of dying from COVID-19 in addition to pollution. So, you know, climate justice, the topic that I'm sure all of us feel very passionately about is fundamentally about racial justice. And so I encourage everybody to educate themselves about the issues that are going on now and join the struggle for justice that we are all part of. So with that, I'm going to share my slides. Here we go. And talk a little bit about my book, as well as the Green New Deal. So, 
Many of you, I'm sure, have been following uh, the Green New Deal, and in many ways, it's a response to this idea that climate justice is about racial justice. And by the way, there's closed captioning available for those of you who need that. Um, so Black, Brown, and Indigenous people uh, are breathing dirtier air. I've already made that point, but there's a really excellent article released last year that I linked to here, which shows that, for example, a lot of the goods and services that white people are consuming in this society, that could be electricity, let's say, that's a benefit, right, using energy. A lot of the pollution that's tied to those benefits that we are getting are being placed in Black, uh, Hispanic, and Indigenous communities. And so the pollution burden in terms of the amount of benefits that we receive versus the externalization of the costs is a racial justice issue. And of course, as I mentioned, this makes it more likely that those people in those communities are going to die from coronavirus. And income inequality is a big problem in this country. If you've looked up any statistics about um, the wealth gap or the income gap, what you'll quickly find is that there are big differences in terms of race. And so um, Black and Indigenous Americans do not have a lot of wealth and they're also paid a lot less. So a lot of the concerns that we might have about the gender pay gap, those concerns also exist on racial lines and in fact are even bigger in many ways. So for example, if you look at what a black woman is being paid versus a white woman or a white man, there are huge pay gaps there. And so we, when we think about climate change and how we're gonna address these problems, when we have big inequalities in this country, including along racial lines, and then our solution is to put a price on carbon, what does that actually do? What it does is it raises the cost of energy for all people in society. And it's actually a pretty big burden on low income Americans because before the pandemic, one in three Americans struggled to pay their energy bills. And so think about right now when unemployment is something like one in five Americans, especially uh, high in the black community, unemployment is the highest there and it's not moving in a good direction. Uh, and you know, how are people supposed to be paying their energy bills without having a job or without being paid a decent wage, you know, not even being paid $15 an hour. And then our solution to the climate crisis is to just raise the cost of energy that is going to make it even harder for these communities. And so the Green New Deal was a policy solution that said, hey, yes, the climate crisis is a huge problem, but we also have a crisis of inequality. And how we think about tackling the climate crisis needs to be informed by this inequality crisis. So I have a new paper, and in fact, uh, last week on Friday, we uh, wrote up the results of this piece in the Washington Post. So if you'd like to see that, um, it's in the Monkey Cage blog on the Washington Post, and I've also tweeted about it. But this is a paper that we published in Environmental Research Letters, which is an open access journal, meaning you can go download this paper for free. It's totally accessible to you. And what we tried to understand is, does the logic of the Green New Deal, where we don't just tackle climate change, but we also tackle some of these um, inequalities, including along racial lines. When we, when we tackle these two crises together, does it make addressing the climate crisis more popular? And so what we did is that we ran something called a conjoint experiment, which is basically a way of saying, hey, person living in the United States, would you rather have a policy that, you know, puts a price on carbon and, you know, causes polluters to pay more but raises your energy bills? Or would you rather have a policy that increases the minimum wage, makes sure that any American who wants a job can have one, um, you know, cleans up our energy system, et cetera. And we asked them, which one do you like more? And what we overwhelmingly found is that including these social um, policies and economic policies that address income inequality makes it more popular to tackle the climate crisis, meaning that the logic of the Green New Deal from a public perspective is actually quite sound. So this is what the results look like. It's a lot of things on a slide. But um, what you can see on the left-hand side is what's the effect when we, in, when we add, let's say, a $15 minimum wage increase to a climate policy, does that increase support for the climate policy? And you can see overall, yes, it does by a fair amount. And on the right-hand side, we can see the partisan effects. So overall, a lot of these things are increasing support amongst Democrats, 
But something like a $15 minimum wage, including that in the climate bill, is not driving Republicans away. And you can see that because that red dot with $15 minimum wage is basically falling along that zero line, which is the dashed line in the middle. So in other words, a bunch of these social policies, particularly including affordable housing and dealing with the housing crisis that we have across this country, increasing people's um, hourly pay to $15 an hour, those are popular and they don't even turn away Republicans. Similarly, things like a job guarantee, which is the idea that any American who wants a job can have one, you know, that's a really popular policy, even amongst um, Democrats and Republicans, retraining fossil fuel workers and making sure that our clean energy jobs are unionized and well paying. Again, if these are popular ideas. Um, now, of course, when we start to talk about costs, and particularly when we put the costs of climate policy onto the household, so if you look at the costs down near the bottom, these are a household cost. So what do you think if we would increase your household costs by $35 a month versus $10 a month? And you can see we're losing a fair amount of support. And what if it's going to increase your cost by $55 a month? So that, that is what would happen with a price on carbon. And you can see that it, it actually drives away support for both Democrats and Republicans. And I think this highlights the fact that for so many Americans, paying your monthly bills is already really hard and particularly paying your monthly energy bills. And so a, probably a smarter idea is to have an investment oriented approach, which is what we have in the size area here, which is the idea that rather than pushing the costs onto everyday Americans, the government, the federal government, would take on spending and as a society put in programs that would allow us to decarbonize our society quickly. Now this is the same results, but looking at um, the effects in terms of income and race. And I, again, it's quite a complicated figure here, but the point is that the Green New Deal is particularly popular amongst Black and Hispanic communities. So if we want to broaden the support for doing this, if we want to have a bigger you know, coalition that cuts across racial lines, the Green New Deal is actually a really good idea. And in fact, if you look at um, the Yale program on climate change communication, which I'm affiliated with, they consistently find that the most supportive people for taking action on climate change are Hispanics Americans and Black Americans. And, you know, I think in part that's because these communities are on the front lines of our pollution and they're on the front lines of the climate crisis. And so they understand that actually this is a crisis that we need to be dealing with right now. So that brings me to my book, which is a which is a, a project that asks the question of, okay, well, if these are important issues, if they're issues that are disproportionately burdening Black and Hispanic and Indigenous Americans, you know, why aren't we tackling them? Why are we not taking on the climate crisis? As um, Sunshine said in the opening, you know, we've already warmed the planet by one degree Celsius. The climate crisis is happening now. You can certainly feel that where I live in Santa Barbara. Last week, we had two forest fires break out, and it's only June. Normally, our fire season would happen in the fall. And, uh, you know, many of you across the country are likely going to experience heat waves at the end of June. That's what the current forecast is. And again, that's very unusual to be having most of the continent in a heat wave. And again, that's linked to climate change. There have already been several named hurricanes in the Atlantic. Normally that doesn't happen until August. We're likely going to face a very intense hurricane season. And of course, when you think about the climate crisis and the pandemic together, it becomes really difficult. Some people don't have air conditioning in their homes and they might go to community cooling centers or libraries or other places if it gets a heat wave. And how will those people do that when they are supposed to be practicing social distancing and staying in their homes? We could be seeing a lot of people dying from heat in the coming weeks potentially in addition to the pandemic. You know, and the same thing about hurricanes or forest fires. If we have climate disasters unfolding, where are people supposed to go? To safety shelters where they're potentially going to be infected with the pandemic? Just like jails are, and um, nursing homes are turning out to be hot spots of these of the pandemic because people cannot leave the space, what's going to happen to shelters for people during climate crises? So 
why are we not taking on this problem? And I gotta say, when I talk to policymakers, I still feel that so few of them really understand the scale of the challenge. And so when I was finishing my book, I tried to understand if we need to clean up our electricity system, how fast do we need to move? And somebody ended up calling these figures that I've been making the narwhal curve. And I have a little video about this if you're interested on GRIST. Um, so you just Google GRIST narwhal curve and you can see a little three minute video that explains the idea. But the basic point is that we are not on track at all to decarbonizing our electricity system. And in many ways, cleaning up the US electricity system is the first linchpin globally for tackling the climate crisis. Because if we can clean up the electricity system in the United States, then it enables other countries around the world to clean up their electricity system. And if we can clean up our electricity system, we can do two other things. We can clean up our transportation system because you can use electric vehicles rather than combustion engine cars. And we can clean up our buildings because we can get rid of fossil gas in our cooking and our heating, and we can instead use all electric homes. So the electricity system is not just about cleaning up the system itself, it's an, about enabling other parts of our energy system to get clean too. And in fact, if we do electricity, transportation, and buildings, that gets us about 70% of the carbon problem in the United States. What we've got to do on top of that is shut down the oil and gas sector, clean up our agricultural sector, and work on heavy industry. So there's still 30% of the problem that needs to be tackled, but getting 70% of the problem would be huge. Because if you know the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, their 1.5 degrees report said that we need to cut emissions by about half by 2030 to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. So if we can do the electricity system by 2030 or 2035, then actually we would be on track to cutting our emissions by about half by 2030. Now, are we at all on track to doing that? Well, let's say we're trying to do it by 2050. That was the timeline that a lot of people were talking about before the Democratic primary. On the one hand, the, the black line, which is this benchmark, well, we seem to be hitting the benchmark, right? But what you should quickly notice is that we've been living on borrowed time. We've been relying on our nuclear fleet and our hydropower capacity, and those things are pretty flat. And at some point, nuclear plants are going to start shutting down, and that is going to be a big problem. Meanwhile, renewables, while they're ramping up, they're not ramping up fast enough. So in 2018, we got about 36%, a little more than one third of our electricity system from clean energy sources. And we need to be growing the grid by at least two percentage points every single year. And in the best year, we only grew it by 1.3 percentage points of renewable energy. Now, what if, oops, my, let me just go back to that. Now, what if, we wanted to do it by 2030 because we said, hey, we understand the IPCC says we need to move faster. Well, this just shows you how far behind we are because you can see that we're falling way below that black benchmark. So we need to be ramping up our deployment enormously. And in fact, we don't really need 100% clean electricity. Technically, if we want to clean up our uh, transportation system and our buildings, we need to be growing the amount of electricity that we're providing. We need to have more capacity. And so we don't really need 100% clean electricity. We need something like 200% clean electricity. So the scale and pace of this challenge are really enormous. And I do not think that most of our policymakers understand this. We have had attempts at the federal level to take on this issue for many years. Throughout the 1990s, advocates were trying to pass something called a renewable portfolio standard, the main policy that I talk about in my book. Sometimes it's called a clean electricity standard. But basically what it says is that here's, what we, here's where we need to be every single year so that we can be cleaning up our electricity system by a certain deadline. Um, advocates have not able to been able to pass this at the federal level, despite many decades of effort. In 2009, the Waxman-Markey bill, which some of you may recall, that's the closest we've come to having a federal climate policy that's comprehensive. That bill passed the House, but did not pass the Senate. And it had within it a target to get to 20% renewable energy by this year, by 2020. I looked back at that in my book and pointed out that had we gotten that policy on the books, we would be farther ahead. 
because you have states like, for example, West Virginia that only have 5% of their electricity system from clean energy sources today, or places like Ohio that have less than 3% of their electricity from renewables. And so having a target of 20%, even though it allowed actually 8% um, of the 20% to be met with efficiency, so technically it was only 12%, that still would have pushed a lot of states and a lot of utilities to be moving faster. But of course it didn't pass. There are current efforts to try to get to 100% clean electricity standard by 2035. And in fact, the Grid Lab and um, the uh, UC Berkeley put out this amazing report two weeks ago, which looked at, can we get to 90% clean electricity by 2035? And they showed that we can. And in fact, it's cheaper than our current electricity system, um, which is amazing. And of course, it's cleaner in terms of the pollution burden, both from carbon dioxide and air pollution. So this is very possible to do. We have to move a lot faster and we need federal commitment, but we can clean up our electricity system if we would only try. So my book focuses a lot at the state level because in the absence of federal leadership on these issues, the states have been fueling decarbonization of our electricity system. In the 1990s, there were efforts by advocates working across the states in a network to try to pass two main policies the Renewable Portfolio Standard and Net Metering Laws, or Net Energy Metering. These laws passed in a variety of states, and what they did was that they started to clean up our electricity system. So as I mentioned, a Renewable Portfolio Standard basically sets a target and a timeline. It says, here's how much clean electricity we're going to have by a certain year. And these were very popular bipartisan ideas in the 1990s, and clean energy advocates were really successful at getting these laws passed and on the books. Net metering laws, maybe some of you are familiar with them. If you have solar on your home, then you're probably using net metering. This is a policy that allows people to generate electricity and to feed it back into the grid and to be paid a fair price for that electricity. So again, these laws were passed throughout the 1990s and it was a group of advocates working together through a network that were really successful at passing these policies. So this is a picture of the Renewable Portfolio Standard as of last year. And you can see here that a lot of states, including some Republican states, have pushed ahead in the absence of federal leadership and have been ratcheting up their policies. Actually, California has a 100% target, um, as does New Mexico. And so a lot of these policies are now targeting 100% clean electricity. Now, what you should notice is that the Southeast is completely absent when it comes to passing these policies. And that is really unfortunate because as I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of old coal plants operating in those states that cost money. They're very expensive to run. If we were to shut those coal plants down and open up a wind farm tomorrow, it would actually be cheaper to be getting our electricity from that wind farm. But a lot of the utilities in the Southeast haven't wanted to shut down those coal plants. And of course, those coal plants are putting out a lot of particulate matter, nitrous oxide, um, mercury. These are pollutants that are really bad for human health. And so Black Americans who live in the Southeast are paying a big price when it comes to the pollution burden from those coal plants that stay open. So why are we not further along? In the 1990s, I told you, a lot of these advocates were successful. They were passing all these laws. We seem to have some momentum on climate change. Well, unfortunately, we've seen a backlash to the momentum that we have. And so fossil fuel companies and electric utilities have been resisting the clean energy transition. And in many ways, it's sort of two steps forward, one step back. In this book, Short Circuiting Policy, what I tried to do was show all the tactics and the dirty tricks that electric utilities and fossil fuel companies are using to try to undermine the lock-in of these policies. Because when these policies were passed, there was this idea that this thing called policy feedback would take place. What do I mean by that? I mean that we would get a clean electricity standard in place for maybe 20% by let's say 2020 or 2025. And all the utilities would start to make progress 
and it would build up new companies, clean energy companies, people working for them. The states would start to see the benefits. You see that a lot in Kansas, for example. In the western part of the state, there's been a lot of wind energy built, and that's been bringing local revenue into school boards. It's been employing people. It's been a really great thing for economic development. And the same thing could be said for the panhandle in Texas, right? These are rural Republican areas that often don't have as much economic investment, and wind energy has been bringing jobs. So you would think that once they saw the success that the policy would get ratcheted up over time that they would pass a more ambitious one well unfortunately that's not what's happened instead the opponents got wise and they decided to attack these laws and what my book does is it shows all the ways that the clean energy transition which already is not moving fast enough is being slowed down even more by electric utilities and fossil fuel companies these companies are doing things like lobbying state legislatures to roll back policies. They're also trying to resist the implementation of laws through our regulatory bodies. And so at the state level, the regulator for our electricity system is called the Public Utility Commission. And in a lot of states, utilities have been saying, hey, let's interpret that law in a way that just slows things down. In addition to those kind of classic ways that we think about how corporations might affect policy, they're also using these indirect ways that are a little bit less visible. Those are things like primaries. Let's say you have a Republican who likes wind energy. In my book, I tell the story of Russ Jennings, who is a Kansas Republican who was in the state legislature and who really supported wind energy. And what happened is that he found himself with a primary challenger. So when fossil fuel companies like Coke Industries and electric utilities like Arizona Public Service don't like the kind of Republican that's in office because that Republican is pro climate change, what they do is that they primary challenge that person. And whether or not that person loses their seat, it sends a signal to all the other Republicans. It creates a chilling effect that says, hey, if you're on the wrong side on climate change, if you actually want to do something about this crisis, you're going to be kicked out of office or you're going to have to work really hard to keep your seat. This is exactly what happened to Bob Inglis, a representative in Congress who had a sort of um, awakening moment and realized that climate change was real and decided to try to work on climate change. Well, he found himself with a primary challenger and he lost his seat in Congress. So using primaries is a way that the fossil fuel companies and electric utilities retain their power and make it so that we don't get Republicans who are willing to take on the climate crisis. They are also doing things called astroturfing or outside lobbying. What do I mean by that? Well, I'll show you some examples, but the basic point is that, you know, we often have social movements where people are upset about something and they're taking to the streets and protesting. We're of course seeing that right now with the Black Lives Matter movement, right? People are really upset and they are protesting and they're writing letters and they're calling people and they're part of a social movement. Well, electric utilities and fossil fuel companies have seen the power that the public has. They see the power of people. But rather than actually find people who support them, because that's quite difficult to do, it turns out that killing people through air pollution and climate crisis is not popular. What they do is they pretend that the public is on their side. And so they make fake public campaigns. For example, in New Orleans, there was a proposed gas plant by an electric utility called Entergy. They wanted to build a new fossil gas plant. And the city council was deciding whether or not to do this. And all these people showed up to the city council and they said, we don't like gas, we really like solar. And um, sorry, I messed it up because it's confusing. They said, we love gas and we really hate solar. This is pretty confusing. Why would people like a new polluting fossil gas plant and not like solar? So there was a journalist there and the journalist went up to these people and they said, hey, how come you guys want this gas plant and don't want the solar plant? And they said, oh, we were paid to be here. We are actors. So this was not the real opinion of these people. It turns out that a public relations firm paid about $25,000 and hired a bunch of actors to show up for the city council meeting and pretend like they were the public who really wanted to build a polluting gas plant.
So those are the kinds of dirty tricks, these fake grassroots campaigns, which we call astroturfing, right? Like fake grass that is playing out across this country. And finally, if electric utilities or fossil fuel companies don't like what's happening, they often take their grievances to the courts. And even if they don't win court cases, they can slow down the implementation. And of course, that's very problematic when it comes to tackling the climate crisis. So this is a figure that kind of stylizes the political system to help you understand the ideas in the book. So after a bill becomes a law, right, that's, that's where a lot of people's thinking ends. They think, yay, we passed this law, we're winning. Well, what my book shows is that actually a lot of conflict and politics continues to play out after the bill becomes a law. That's where that policy feedback starts to take place. Because what laws do is they redistribute resources between advocates for the law, so that would be clean energy companies, environmental groups, and opponents against the law electric utilities and fossil fuel companies, right? They're putting costs on fossil fuel companies and electric utilities, and they're giving benefits to renewable energy companies. They're starting a new industry and shutting another one down. Well, the interest groups respond to that, and they don't just sort of lay down and play dead. An electric utility is a hundred-year-old company that's very politically powerful. They maintain long-term relationships with legislators, and so what they do is if they don't like the law and it's taken away resources from them, they try to fight back. And they can do that directly by giving campaign contributions to advocates um, in the legislature, politicians who share their view, but they can also do that indirectly through the public. And that is the astroturfing campaigns that I've just been talking about. So for example, in Kansas, Coke Industries behind the scenes was working very hard to get rid of a clean electricity law in that state. I talk about this in my book. And so all of a sudden, while, the, while they were working on that, a group popped up called the Kansas Seniors Alliance. And there were these flyers being sent around that said, Kansas seniors are already financially stressed. Higher utility bills aren't helping. So a journalist went to find out, well, who is this group? Who is behind it? There was no website for this group. There was no people really involved. They could only find the person who registered the organization, and it was a lawyer. And they went to the lawyer and they said, hey, why did you register this organization? Who's your client? And the lawyer said, oh, I don't work for the Kansas Senior Alliance. I work for Americans for Prosperity. Americans for Prosperity is the grassroots arm of Coke Industries, a very large fossil fuel company in this country. And so what they had done, probably, is registered a fake group which pretended like Kansas seniors were all upset about electricity bills and made it seem to politicians like they were going to face challenges from the public if they kept this policy in place. So these kinds of dirty tricks where the public is made to seem like it has one view when that's not really true are being used by electric utilities and fossil fuel companies across the country. Another thing that they do, which I've already mentioned, is that they primary challenge Republicans in particular that don't share their views. So interest groups, if, the, if a law has been passed, try to change the people making the decisions about what kind of law we should have. And in Arizona, this happened quite a lot. Arizona Public Service is a private utility that spent uh, over $50 million over several years trying to roll back clean electricity laws in that state. And that included spending an enormous amount on primaries for the elected commissioners in their own regulator. Some regulators are elected rather than appointed. And you might think that's a good thing, but in practice, it can lead to capture where the regulated entity, the utility, gets to basically choose who their watchdog is. It's like they get to choose who the police is overseeing them. And they're always obviously going to choose people who are going to be lax on them. And in this case, commissioners who don't worry about um, increasing solar energy in Arizona. So this strategy that they've been using is not only changing the kinds of Republicans that we have in office, but it's also changing the public. Because it turns out that political science has shown that the public learns what they should be thinking about a policy issue by looking at what the politicians who share their views think. 
So if I'm a Republican and I'm looking at what Mitch McConnell is saying or what Donald Trump is saying, and I see that they're saying that Donald Trump is anti-wind energy, then I'm more likely to be anti-wind energy too. Because the public is kind of taking their cues from the politicians. So much as the politicians have been polarizing because of what interest groups are doing, the next thing that happens is that the public polarizes. So you can see this in this data. If you go back to 2007 or 2008, renewable energy was extremely popular and bipartisan. It was like motherhood or apple pie. Everybody liked it. But what started to happen is as fossil fuel companies and electric utilities ramped up their campaign against climate policy, support in the public began to drop. And you can think about, for those of you who may have seen this advertisement that Newt Gingrich and Nancy Pelosi made um, just about a decade ago, they were sitting on a couch, actually it would be more than that now, maybe 15 years ago, they were sitting on a couch in front of Capitol Hill and they said, we don't agree on many things, but we do agree on climate change. So climate change was actually quite a bipartisan issue, but it stopped being a partisan issue when fossil fuel companies and electric utilities became threatened. They understood that if these laws were to pass something like a waxman marquee bill, that it would impose costs on their business and they would start um, to not be able to extract as many fossil fuels, which is of course the goal, right? We need to stop burning fossil fuels to take on the climate crisis. And so what they did is that they drove polarization. So the last thing I want to say is that my book talks a lot about the role that electric utilities and fossil fuel companies have played, not just in delaying action, which is what I've been talking about, but also in promoting climate denial, in lying about the science of climate change. Many of you are probably familiar with the work of Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway, as well as Jeffrey Supran. They've done fantastic work in Merchants of Doubt, the book, which is also a documentary I'd recommend, as well as um, work on Exxon and what Exxon knew about climate change. And the fact is that fossil fuel companies have known about the climate crisis and have had extremely good scientists within their companies projecting out where we're supposed to be with amazing accuracy back in the 80s and even 70s. They've known it. But rather than telling the truth, they have been lying about the science of climate change. And that has created an enormous amount of confusion amongst our policymakers and politicians and has delayed action for a long time. But what you might not know, what my book documents, is that electric utilities have also been key to climate denial. Many of the climate denial organizations that were set up in the 1990s, like the Global, Global Climate Coalition, involved electric utilities to the same degree. They were working right alongside fossil fuel companies. And that wasn't the only thing that they did. They also promoted a very wasteful energy system. Um, we can, for example, when we're burning fossil fuels, also create steam, right? That's a byproduct of making electricity. And we can use that steam to heat buildings or to use uh, in industrial processes. And in the mid 20th century, a lot of industrial facilities were using both the steam and the electricity. Um, but they, the electric utilities didn't want industrial customers to make their own electricity. They wanted to be able to sell it. And so what they did was that they created really low contracts and basically priced out of the system the more efficient industrial cogeneration. And that means that we burned a lot more fossil fuels than we would have otherwise. And of course, in the contemporary period, they've been working to roll back clean energy laws. So if you're interested in this part of my book, I've published an excerpt from the book on the website Drill News, which is an excellent site that's been keeping track of, for example, um, what has been happening during the pandemic. A lot of fossil fuel companies have been using the pandemic as cover to sort of um, roll back environmental protections. And of course, the bailout money through the CARES Act has been going to fossil fuel companies. We don't even know how much is going to it. And so Amy Westervelt, who runs Drill News, has a tracker where she's keeping track of all the environmental rollbacks that are happening during the pandemic. So I'd recommend you check out both my little piece on her website, as well as her website and her um, tracker overall. So if you'd like to get a copy of my book, um, the way to do it is you can go to the Oxford University Press website, which is just bit.ly slash scp-book. 
Um, you can buy it directly from them. Um, there's a discount code if you'd like to get one for 30% off. It's that, those, those numbers there, A-S-F-L-Y-Q-6. I feel like I'm checking in for a flight or something, but that's the discount code. And you can also buy a copy of the ebook, as Sunshine mentioned, and it's very inexpensive. It's only um, $11. And so just bit.ly slash SCP dash Kindle, and um, you can get a copy that way. Um, so thanks so much. And I think at this point, I'm going to look at the Q&A and see what kinds of questions people have had. Thank you so much, Leah. That was an incredible summary of so many things. There's a lot that um, I'm going to have to go back and watch this again myself just to keep soaking it all in. Um, so clearly, this book is a great resource for all of us. I'll, I'll start by um, sharing a question that came in from a couple people in different ways, which was about um, carbon fees with dividends returned to people. So can you tell us anything about how people respond to that idea or, and or what might be preventing it from being pursued? Yeah, so a carbon fee and dividend is a popular idea. It's particularly promoted by the citizens climate lobby. Maybe some people on this call are part of that organization. Um, after the Wax and Markey bill fa failed, Theda Scotchbull, a political scientist at Harvard University, wrote a white paper where she said that part of the problem was that there weren't clear benefits in the climate policy for people. And so one solution to that idea is a carbon fee and dividend. Another solution is, of course, a Green New Deal, right? So we have to think about how can we communicate benefits to people. Um, now, in Canada, the government, the federal government, has actually implemented a carbon fee and dividend policy. And some of my research collaborators, including Matt O'Mildenberger and Catherine Harrison and Eric LaChapelle, have been studying that policy in Canada as it's been unfolding. And what they've been doing is that they've been surveying people before the policy comes into place, after the policy comes into place, and they're, they're, uh, they have greater costs because that's the, the fee part, right? Electricity bills go up. And then after they get the dividend back, which is the benefit. And the interesting thing is that it doesn't seem to increase support. And because they're actually looking at the exact same people, they can identify that effect extremely well. In fact, in their study, they even show people, here's the tax return and here's exactly how much money you would get back. And still, the benefits don't seem to be as salient to people as those costs at the, for example, at the gas pump or on their monthly electricity bills. And so I think there are questions as to whether or not we can make the benefits salient enough through um, a cap and dividend approach. Um, and personally, you know, I think that going with a carbon price at this point in time is not sufficient, that we're just not going to be moving fast enough. And what we really need is a large scale investment approach. So I tend to favor what we might call standards. So a clean electricity standard saying, here's where we need to go in buildings and transportation in electricity with investments. So the federal government putting money on the table to making that go faster. And of course, centering justice, where we make sure that frontline communities, including Black, Hispanic, and indigenous communities that have been bearing the costs of pollution for so long that we make sure we center them in the investments that we're making. So I tend to favor that sort of standards in investment justice approach, in part because of the research that suggests that this cap and dividend may not be as popular as we may hope. Great, thank you. Um, there's another question here from Rebecca who says, many utilities in my area are shutting down the majority of their coal plants but keeping one because of the fear that battery storage is not reliable enough to go to 100% renewables. What are your thoughts on that? Well, first of all, we definitely do not need to keep coal plants open. Um, you know, if you're going to keep fossil gas as a backup, it should be gas, right? It should, or fossil fuels as a backup, it should be gas, fossil gas, natural gas plants. It should not be coal. Why? Because coal is a very dirty energy source. It puts particulate matter in the air, which gets into our lungs, makes it more likely for us to die from COVID. Um, it puts mercury, sulfur dioxide, nitrous oxide. There's an enormous amount of crap, for lack of a better word, that goes up into the air when we burn coal. Natural gas, theoretically, is a cleaner source, right? It doesn't have as much stuff in the gas. And so when we burn it, we're not putting all that other stuff in the air. The other thing is that natural gas may be lower from a carbon perspective, right? There's, there's questions about that because of leakage, meaning small amounts of methane that are kind of methane being natural gas that are leaking throughout the system. If leakage is more than, let's say, three or four percent, 
then actually natural gas is worse from a carbon perspective than coal because methane is a very potent gas and once it gets into the atmosphere it creates a lot of warming but overall there's a view that natural gas is probably much better than coal so no coal plants need to be shut down as soon as possible they are terrible investments and a lot of utilities are keeping them open um, not because of backup or things like that but because they sunk a lot of debt into them okay they had they were faced with these choices about a decade ago should we shut down the plant or should we retrofit them to deal with the mercury rule the mercury rule required plants to put new scrubber technology and to retrofit them so that they didn't put as much mercury pollution into the air and that rule took 20 years to finalize just to be clear to go back to the point of delay um, so that's why there's a lot of debt on these plants and these utilities are faced with the question of how are we going to pay off these debts there's better ways to pay off the debt and shut down the plants that's what's been happening in new mexico for example new mexico passed a law called the energy transition act which is paying the utility to shut down the coal plant and get rid of that debt but Ohio, which I talk to him and document in my book, actually is paying the utility to keep the coal plant open, which is the worst of all possible worlds. So as I mentioned, that amazing Grid Lab report suggests we can get to 90% clean electricity by 2035. And so if we need an additional 10%, that's much better to come from some of the gas. And by the way, we have enough gas in this country many times over. So we should not be building any new fossil gas plants as backup at this moment in time. Um, so there are so many incredible questions here and I apologize to everyone that we're not gonna have time to get to them. So I'm trying to take some kind of general broader questions. Um, one of them is about international climate action. Um, how do you think, this comes from Julia, how do you think individual state commitments and policy can fit into these larger climate policy efforts like the Paris Agreement, which is obviously made between nations? Yeah, so, you know, I think we spend a lot of time as an environmental community focusing on the international negotiations um, because we have this theory that climate change is a collective action problem, meaning that if the United States doesn't act, other countries don't act. But I actually think that's not true. Think about Germany. Germany went way ahead on solar energy. Now, Germany's been absolutely terrible on coal and nuclear, just to be clear, but they went way ahead on solar and they, in fact, built a whole solar industry for the entire world. They brought down the cost of solar for every other country in the world. And they didn't do that because of a Paris Agreement or anything else. They did that because of their own domestic politics. So I tend to think that it's actually a bigger issue in terms of who's in the White House, who controls Congress, what can the United States do? Because if the United States can clean up their electricity system, we don't necessarily need to have a big agreement where everybody says, here's what we're gonna do by this timeline. We can just have cheaper, better technology that we share with other parts of the world and that cleans up the energy system everywhere. So, you know, I think the Paris Agreement is really important, maybe for um, sharing capacity, for sharing resources, literally financial flows between rich countries and poor countries, and certainly could be important for technology as we get technology, how can we make sure we're sharing it for cheap at a level that other countries can afford? But in terms of thinking, like, if I set this goal, then other countries will go along with it too. We've just seen time and time again that um, countries don't seem to want to race each other to clean up their energy system. So what we really need to do is focus on domestic politics. And if you're interested in that argument, there's another book called Carbon Captured, which is a new book by Matt Mildenberger that gets all into those details, and I'd really recommend it. Wonderful. Okay, well, let's come back to the U.S. then. Um, uh, do, Rennie asks, are there particular types of efficiency or clean energy policy that tend to be more popular with, say, Democrats or Republicans, or to look at this a different way, have certain policy approaches um, to clean energy specifically kind of been taken up differently across these ideologies? Yeah, so in that paper that I shared at the beginning uh, about the Green New Deal, we actually looked at if we design a clean electricity standard in slightly different ways, how does that affect support? So if we include nuclear, does that increase or decrease support? If we include carbon capture sequestration, you know, these are some ideas that Republican politicians tend to champion more than Democrats. Um, although on the nuclear, I think that's changing a little bit. Um, but, you know, 
what we find is that the public doesn't pay a lot of attention to that level of detail of policy, right? So it's really important for those of us who are really paying attention or are trying to get things designed in the right way. But when it comes to the public, what they really want is for their politicians to be taking on this crisis and to be passing laws that actually get the job done. When it comes to energy efficiency, we might think about really scaling up investment programs federally that actually pay people to retrofit their homes, that pay them to get rid of fossil gas in their homes. And you could imagine an entire new industry could build up in the United States, which is a company that comes to your home, that makes it more efficient, and that removes gas. And that company, if there was an incentive in place, could be making money to do that. So I think that that kind of an approach could be really popular if there are investment dollars at the federal level behind it. And it would also create an enormous amount of jobs. The thing that people need to understand is, um, on the one hand, it's really overwhelming climate change, right? We have so much to do in so little time. But on the other hand, we're facing a massive economic crisis right now and people need jobs and things to do. Well, one thing that they can do is build electric vehicles, build charging infrastructure, retrofit every building in this country, right? clean up our electricity system, clean, you know, work on public lands, build renewable energy on every corner of this country. That is so much work. It will put people to work in good paying jobs. And so actually this is a big opportunity and I'm hopeful that in 2021, we have an opportunity to actually build a, a green stimulus and to get people to work doing these things. Excellent. Love this. And, and that gets to um, a question that someone asked about. Um, well, two questions. One is, what's, this comes from Whitney, what is the best way to stay aware of the latest movements regarding local policy, regarding clean energy across the U.S.? Um, so let's go with that one first. And then the second answer, the second question rather, is really about, as an individual, what can we do to push for this sort of work? Yeah, so I would really encourage people to join an organization in your community. I'll point out a couple. Um, there's 350.org. They have chapters all across this country. They're quite active in my community, working on blocking fossil fuel development, for example, keeping track of things that are happening in the local community. The Sierra Club has state chapters all across this country. They've got amazing campaigns like the Beyond Coal campaign, and they're now working on trying to stop gas and shut down gas plants. So plugging into that organization um, and their local chapters can help you stay up to date on what's happening in your state. Um, the Citizens Climate Lobby is an organization that's mostly focused at the federal level, but again has chapters all across this country. And the Sunrise Movement is an amazing organization, primarily aimed at young people, but not exclusively, which is working on building up power. So figure out who's active in my community. What's an organization can I that I can join? Even if you just get on a listserv for a local organization, they can email you when there's an action. Think about what's been happening with the Black Lives Matter movement. So many local organizers are saying, hey, we want you to write to your police. We want you to write to your city council. We want you to write to the state government and, and ask for these things. So you want to be just as plugged into the climate justice movement as the racial justice movement. And what does that involve? It involves joining an organization. That can be as simple as getting on a listserv. You could be giving $10 a month. You could be going to meetings, whatever it is. Um, but I think that is really important in terms of staying plugged in. And in terms of what you can do as an individual, um, you know, the thing is, climate change is an institutional problem. I've been talking about this, right? A lot of us feel like racism is a terrible thing in our society, and we think about our own role in perpetuating it, and maybe we feel guilty, et cetera. And that's valuable work, and the same thing can happen on climate change. We can feel guilty about our carbon footprint. But ultimately, most of the racism and the carbon emissions are institutional and structural problems, meaning the solution is not just to sort of talk to your kids and feel guilty, it's to reduce funding to the police so that they don't have military grade weapons, right? It's to put in place different laws so that police officers are actually held accountable if they murder Americans, right? And the same thing is true for climate change. Yes, you can feel guilty and worry about your carbon footprint, but guess what? We've all been staying home <laughs> for several months and carbon emissions will fall this year probably by 8%. Guess what? If we want to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, we have to cut carbon emissions 8% every single year from now until 2030. 
So we can't do it. We've wrung out all the juice from that individual action. You're not taking a flight. You're not going anywhere. Your carbon footprint is pretty tiny right now compared to the past. And that should turn your eyes open to the fact that it's the utilities, it's the fossil fuel companies, and we have to fight those big companies. And that's a hard issue, right? Because it means you have to be part of a movement. You have to be part of something by yourself because you probably can't unilaterally take down an electric utility. But if you work with others, you can. And I think that a lot of the pressure that's been building over the last year has shown what is possible if we work together. So join an organization. And um, I think that's really the way forward. That is a fantastic um, final comment. Thank you so much, Leah Stokes, for uh, sharing your, your insights with us and your research with us. Thanks to all of you for joining us today. And um, again, make sure you check out her book, Short Circuiting Policy. You can find it for your Kindle from Amazon. You can find it from Oxford University Press. Uh, is that right? Yep. Oxford University Press, including the um, discount code she shared. I will note because many people have asked that we will post this video on the Metcalf Institute YouTube channel um, by tomorrow at the latest. So be sure to check that out as well as all of our other lectures. And that's it for today. So join us again tomorrow for the continuation of this series. Thanks again, Dr. Leah Stokes. Thanks so much for having me. And sorry if I went a little fast. That's a, that's a problem that I have. <laughs> Great to see you all. Stay in the climate fight. <laughs> you too. Thank you. Bye-bye.